Something's coming. I can feel it. Something's always coming, I guess. Some kind of storm rolling in, always threatening. This looks like another big one. My dad always said, a man's gotta be ready for anything. You do the work, you hunker down, you take care of what's yours. A man don't run when the storm's coming. That's what he said. You be strong, you be the mountain, you don't move. <sighs> he was a mountain, all right. Then he was gone. Sometimes mountains fall. The storm hits, the waters come up fast. Mountains can crumble and slide right off into the sea. I've seen it happen. I'm no mountain, and I'm not standing out here on my own, Dad. I found something stronger. God is my refuge. I don't run away, but I do run to Him. He shows up every time. He helps when it gets bad. Maybe this storm will miss us. Maybe not. Let it come, whatever it is. I'm not afraid anymore. I'm not even gonna try to handle it on my own. I've seen what God can do. He is the storm sometimes. He's all the strength I need. He's the real mountain. I won't move as long as I'm with him. So I'm sticking with him, Dad. He is God. Join me in a word of prayer as we begin our service. Father, we come to you today. And as this video just reminded us, Father, you are our refuge and our strength. You are our rock and our salvation. As your people, Lord, we are weak. And oftentimes, Lord, we're faithless. But in the midst of crisis, in the midst of turmoil, Lord, you remind us time and time again that you will be with us. And there's nothing more clear to us than the fact that you sent Jesus Christ to die on the cross in our place, to forgive us of sin, and then to resurrect from the grave to give us life, hope, and a future. And we meet here today as your people to lift high the name of Jesus, the name that is above every other name, because he alone is worthy of our praise. He alone is worthy of our worship. So Lord, would you meet with us here today as we sing your praises? And we gather to hear from you in your word. Bless us today, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, good morning, church family. Stand and worship with us this morning. Sing with us. Crown him king of kings. Crown him lord of lords. Wonderful. The mighty God, Emmanuel, God is with us, and He shall reign, He shall reign, He shall reign forever. him king of kings crown him lord of lords wonderful counselor the mighty god emmanuel god is with Oh 
Okay, church family, you can be seated. Welcome, my name is Doug Myers, pastor at Greer First Baptist Church and a great crowd for our 11 o'clock service. We had a similar number at 9 o'clock, about 100 or so. And I know that there are many of you at home that are enjoying us online, so let me extend my greeting to you as well. So we've already begun strongly. We are worshiping the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. And through our praise, we indeed are crowning Him. And He is worthy of being crowned, I can assure you. So I've already been around and I've met many of you. Some, are it's your first time here at Greer First Baptist Church. And you've already figured out we cannot meet in our sanctuary right now. But with COVID-19, we like the gym because we can spread the chairs out. So it works really good. Thank you for being here. Right now, we're not passing out the forms because of social distancing. But here's how you let us know that you're here and you're new to our church. Just email us. Pastor at Greer FBC, like First Baptist Church, dot org. Pastor at Greer FBC dot org. Just give us your name and number and, and uh, tell us that you're visiting. And we will return your email, I can assure you. Well, again. We're here to lift up Christ. That's the main thing. But let me prepare your heart for the end of our service. The very end of our service today, we're going to get to show, and this is an an act of appreciation. It's really a privilege that we have. To say that we love and we appreciate Josh Morton and his wife, Hannah, as they will be leaving us after this Sunday to an incredible ministry in Fredericksburg, Virginia. And I'm going to share with you later how we can socially distance, show them some love, okay? We're going to show you how to do that. But let me just say that we are so appreciative of how they have led us three and a half years at Greer First Baptist Church. And so you're going to get a chance to tell them um, how much you love them after the service. But again, we're here to worship, and he is worthy of our worship. Let's pray together, please. Father, in this worship service here in this gymnasium, we exalt your name. We lift up on high the name of Jesus Christ. And for those of us here or those of us at home that's worshiping in our living rooms or, or maybe uh, uh, outside somewhere, we remember that you're our God and that we get the privilege of praying to you, singing to you. You're worthy of worship. But Lord, draw us to yourself. Use your Holy Spirit to draw us. And then as we study your word in a few minutes, open up the truth of your word so that we might be discipled as you would want to lead us. And again, we thank you for a time of worship. We love you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, church, stand as we continue to worship. This next song is Kings and Kingdoms. It's kind of been the theme of our um of our our sermon series so we want to cap it off this week with kings and kingdoms sing with us when the mountains shake crash into the sea 
When the oceans roar their troubled song, when the nations rage, when there is no peace, and the cries of war are loud and strong, we will not be moved, we will not be
stops working. What a powerful message. Absolutely. And I hope that you, that resonates with you no matter what's going on in your life. Your anxieties or fears or even your joys. Just that God is our focus. and he, He's trustworthy. Well, we come to a very important part of our service where we have a chance to give back to Him. And it's a joyous time. And I'm so thankful for you. The, you figured out how to give online or drop by the office or mail in your gifts and of course on the way out we have these new giving boxes we appreciate every gift you know every summer you can anticipate it just like setting your watch you know giving tends to slow down in the summer and, and we've seen that we, we've seen that um, but you know God has provided our needs just give you one illustration of that so as you've come in the last two Sundays you've noticed the roof, okay, and it's uh, being changed and all kinds of stuff's going on. That's good because, again, we cannot meet our sanctuary. Do we have some major things fixed? Um, but, wow, who could have thought four months ago we could have had enough funds to go ahead and take care of a very expensive roof? So that's just one way. But your staff has been watching every dime. They sacrificed themselves. Um, and you've been obedient in your giving. So keep it up. And I just want to commend you to keep being faithful in your giving. But let's pray that God would multiply what we give for his kingdom. Let's pray, please. Father, you are good. In a time of giving, we remember every good thing we enjoy comes from you anyway. The clothes on our back, and the, the shelter we have. Every bite of food we put in our mouth, you provided that, and so we trust you. Even in difficult times, we trust you even more. So take what we give to you now, multiply it, because 
We want to see the gospel of Jesus Christ go forward in this church. So we love you, Jesus. In your name we pray. ask you to turn to Daniel chapter 9 or you look at mobile, mobile device the scripture will be on the screen as well Daniel chapter 9 and as we sang earlier kings and kingdoms fall but the Lord our God shall reign forevermore and that has been the theme worship song the last three months and it's the theme of Daniel and it's so cool every Every chapter we come to, no matter exactly how it's laid out, that's the thing that continues to come forward. That God is the one that's in control. And so we see one king, and then we see another kingdom come, and, and the Lord's doing it. And the Lord is in the midst. And it speaks so powerfully to the days we are in today. And so whether you're talking about the virus, or you're talking about the political nature of our world, or the political nature of of our country God is the one who raises up the leaders God is the one that puts them down God has got a plan he is faithful he's in control and we see it literally in every chapter in the book of Daniel so indeed I'm glad the last three months we have been studying working our way through one of the greatest books in all the Bible and remember he's good God is good and Daniel knows that full well and as we look into chapter 9, we see an old man. We see Daniel in his late 80s. And his testimony has been through the ups and downs and being taken captive, being thrown into a den of lions, all the things that he has seen. God is faithful, God is in control, and Daniel loves God. But his time is drawing near, and most scholars believe Daniel never makes his way back from Babylon he never makes it all the way back to Jerusalem but he can see it he can see it and we're going to see that powerfully in Daniel chapter 9 now Daniel chapter 9 has some of the most interesting and yet confusing and most debated scriptures in all the Bible many books have been written about Daniel chapter 9 matter of fact the last four verses of Daniel chapter 9 will entire books have been written about this mysterious and confusing things well here's what I want you to do in this one sermon remember the main thing we, we talk about looking at the forest not concentrating on the trees because this is a message of hope God is going to give Daniel a powerful example of hope in him it is something I don't know about you but at least for me I need this hope you'll see hope out of Daniel chapter 9. And here's the first point. You'll see it on the screen. It's this. That God speaks to his people through his word. And we respond in requests and confessions through prayer. So if you were just wondering the line. That first two words of that point is good. God speaks. Believe me. God speaks. God speaks to his people through his word. And we respond in requests and confessions through prayer. Let's dig into the scripture. First six verses. Of Daniel chapter 9. It says in the first year of Darius. The son of Ashurus. A Mede by birth. Who was made king over the Chaldean kingdom. In the first year of his reign. I Daniel understood from the books. According to the word of the Lord. To the prophet Jeremiah. That the number of years. For the desolation of Jerusalem. Would be 70. So I turned my attention to the Lord God. To seek him by prayer and petitions with fasting, sackcloth, and ashes. And I prayed to the Lord my God and confessed, Ah, oh Lord, 
the great and awe-inspiring God who keeps his gracious covenant with those who love him and keep his commands. We have sinned, done wrong, acted wickedly, rebelled, and turned away from your commands and ordinances. We have not listened to your servants, the prophets, who spoke in your name to our kings, leaders, ancestors, and all the people of the land. Wow. It's a confusing time in Babylon. Really, the Babylonians are no longer in charge. It says that Darius is in charge. Okay, this is the first leader of the new Medes and Persians that have taken away the power from Babylon and now they are in charge. And Daniel, even though he's an old man, he's still there. Now this has been prophesied in other visions and other dreams. Daniel knew that there would be a new, a new leader, a new nation to take control. So this is the very first year. Let me remind you it's a very important year because this is the same year that Daniel will be thrown into the lion's den. You remember the first six chapters of Daniel, it's chronological. But the last six chapters looks back. So as far as the chronology in chapter 9, it goes along with chapter 6. This is about the time that Daniel will be cast into the den of lions. It's a confusing time. There's a new king in charge. There's a new kingdom here. But where do we see Daniel? Where do we see old Daniel? Well, we see him in God's word. We see him studying, studying the Bible. Matter of fact, I like this part. We don't just have to guess which part of the Old Testament Daniel's studying. It tells us that he's looking at the prophet Jeremiah. So think about it. Daniel's looking at the same Verses and chapters that you and I can look at today in Jeremiah. And actually you can find it. I believe it's in chapter 25. Daniel is studying these things. And he's, he's praying to God. And he understands that the captivity of God's people put in Babylon is going to be 70 years. And Daniel, he's good at math. He made a perfect score on the SAT. He's able to add it up. And he figures out that it, it, it doesn't have much longer. And although he is unlikely to make it back to Jerusalem, he knows that God's people are going to make it back to Jerusalem and they're going to be able to rebuild the temple and worship will commence again there in Jerusalem. He understands that the days of desolation are almost complete. The 70 years is almost up. Now Daniel's lived one of the most incredible lives of any prophet. The ups, the downs, but what has been consistent is he's been faithful. And he's not been thrown any curveballs when this king comes and this one acts crazy and this one does different things and then there's another one. He's consistently looking to his God. And that's a good place for me and you to look today. Oh, I know it's hard. We look at our phones and our mobile devices and we, we see it on social media, the craziness that is today's world. And for the few of us to, that still get the newspaper, right? I mean, we can read about it there. Or we can turn on the evening news and we can look and we think, wow, these are some difficult days. These are some strange days. Well, Daniel, believe me, he saw some difficult days. He saw the lions face to face. He understands that. But he is what? He is studying God's word. He has hope in an uncertain world in God's word. And that's where we can find hope today. So I hope you see the application. <laughs> the application, of course, is are we spending time with God? I mean, if there's ever been a more important day in these days for us to be in God's word and to put our face and direct our face to him I don't know about it I mean these are important days for us to seek God and to read his word what, what a privilege it is to have God's word in our language at our fingertips it's not always been the case but in these days for us today we can see God and we can see his word and we can study 
God's word. And you say, well, I've heard you say that before, Pastor. Well, I'll stop saying it when everybody does it. Amen. I mean, we've got to be in God's word. You say, well, I don't know where to start. We'll start somewhere. That's the best place to start. The best discipleship tool I know, it's get God's word and read it. If you don't know what to read, read the Gospel of Mark. It reads kind of like a novel. If you like exciting things and stories and action movies, well, Mark's the best place. Out of the four Gospels, read the Gospel of Mark. You want to be encouraged? Read Ephesians. Read the book of Philippians. Amen? I mean, get into God's Word. He promises us that as we read His Word, not one of His words will return void. In other, words, in other words, if we read God's word, we'll never have to say, I want my money back. I want a return on this investment. No, it'll never return void. God will speak to us in his word. I've heard some preachers sometimes has been on TV. I try not to watch too many of those guys. Half of them are crazy, maybe more than that. But they say, you know, God spoke to me in a dream and he told me to do this. And it's something different than the Bible. Don't listen to that. But then, I say, then I've heard people say, I've heard God speak audibly. And I think, well, you know, I don't, I don't, I don't know. And then people say, well, I want God to speak to me audibly. And I got the answer for you, though. If you want to hear God speak in an audible, re, real voice, take his Bible and read it out loud. I mean, that's, if you do that, God is speaking in an audible voice because he speaks through his word. Read it. Study it. Listen to it. The great South African missionary Andrew Murray said this about spending time with God. We need to shut the world out. Withdraw from all the worldly thoughts and occupations. And shut yourself in alone with God to pray to him in secret. Let this be the chief object in prayer to realize the presence of your heavenly father. I mean, you get to commune with God. We get to commune with God. We read his word. And then we do like Daniel did. We turn and then we pray unto him. Speak to God through prayer. Listen to him as he speaks through his word. Look at it this way. I know all of us have major decisions. Some of you in this room, some of you at home, you got some major decisions ahead. I understand that. Work, relationships, school, all kinds of different things, financial decisions. Whatever it is, seek God in his word. Ask God to speak to you in his word. I mean, for, for us as a church, I mean, right now as a staff, quite honestly, we're meeting every week about COVID-19 and, and how we can encourage our people. And we so long to want to see more of our adults meet back together. Micah and JG long for our students to be able to meet more together. Gretchen and Amy and others and leaders, we're, we're, we're meeting about how can we See our children gathered back together. We want all that. We want to do it in a wise way. Pray for us. We're seeking God's word. We're praying to God so that we might hear from him. As you know, we can't meet in the sanctuary right now. It's kind of interesting. Daniel chapter 9 talks about longing to be in the sanctuary. We, we can understand that, right church? And so thankfully we, we got the roof almost taken care of. And then there's other decisions we got to make. God speak to us. Speak to our leadership team. Speak to our Vision 2020 uh, team. Speak to our staff. Speak to all of our people to know your ways. He will speak. I have full confidence in, in that. Three and a half years ago, we didn't have a worship leader. and We were trying to combine the traditional service and the contemporary service because we did a poll and everybody wanted to be together, but we all like different kinds of music. It's kind of like your home. Amen? You have children and grandchildren whatever. Everybody likes something different. God brought us to Josh and Hannah. And, and so three and a half years ago, God responded to that heartfelt request. And I have full assurance that God will speak to us again for the future. Hey, listen. He wants to disclose his will. He speaks to us through his word. He speaks to us even as we pray unto him. We give our hearts and our requests to him. I want you to see something else out of his word. You'll see it right on the screen. This is point number, number, number two. Okay, this is number two. God answers his uncertain people with a certain hope and future. <laughs> Told you it's good news. God answers his uncertain people, that's us, with a certain hope and a future. Hey, newsflash, 
you don't have all the information. You don't always know what to do. That's especially true for me. Give you an example. So my wife and my middle child, Mary Catherine, they're on a little trip. It's kind of an after high school graduation trip with some girlfriends, okay? And so Wednesday, uh, we noticed that the car, and Janet had to drive, and the car was not producing air conditioning. Now listen, in 25 years of marriage, I'm still learning, but one thing I learned a while ago, my wife appreciates air conditioning, okay? And so if she's going to be in a car for seven hours with a car full of girls, we understood we've got to have air conditioning. Well, I'm not very handy mechanic, but you know, I, but I do have YouTube, amen? And so I looked at YouTube, and I figured out, you know, I could save about $130 if I followed this eight-minute diatribe on, you know, you buy this and under the thing and you remove this bolt and, and this kind of thing. But then all of a sudden, God spoke to me through wisdom. I didn't have to read this in the Word, and, it, and pretty much it said, you better not do that, Doug. Take it to somebody who knows what they're doing, okay? And so that's what I did. And it was the best $160 I think I ever spent letting a professional do it so that my wife in 95 degree heat could be assured that somebody who's got all the information is able to fix the air conditioning. So, thank the Lord, literally, I mean this, um, that they have air conditioning, okay? And so, but you say, well, that, you know, that's a little illustration, but it, it, it's so true because we kind of want to take things on our own. And we think we've got the way and we figure things out by now, but really, we need to submit ourselves to the one who's got more information. I give you God. He knows the future. The very hairs on your head are numbered. Okay, that works for about 80% of us in this room. I mean, he knows everything. He knows how to take care of us. He cares for the sparrows. How will he not care for us? He's got the answers. and We can trust him. All right, so this uncertain people, how does God give us this certain hope? Well, here in Daniel, chapter 9, verse 20, look what God does. Verse 20. It says, while I was speaking, again, Daniel's pouring out his heart to God. He's praying. While I was speaking and praying and confessing my sin and the sin of my people Israel and presenting my petition before the Lord my God concerning the holy mountain of my God, while I was praying, Gabriel, the man I had seen in the first vision, reached me in my extreme weariness about the time of the evening offering. He gave me this explanation. Daniel, I've come now to give you understanding. At the beginning of your petitions, an answer went out, and I have come to give it. For you are treasured by God. So consider the message and understand the vision. All right, here it is. God's going to answer Daniel. God's been studying his word. And in return, Daniel prays. And oh, how he prays. We didn't read all the verses. It's a glorious prayer in the middle part of Daniel chapter 9. He prays. And not only does he pray, he, he gives out his petitions, his requests before God. But not only that, he confesses his sin. But not only that, God, Daniel confesses the sin of God's people because they're in captivity because they had rebelled against a wonderful God. But now that time of judgment is about to end. And so with sackcloth and ashes, that means that ashes, it means he is repenting. He's doing his very best. He's fasting and praying and sackcloth and ashes. And he's giving out his request to God. God responds. And God answers Daniel. And oh, how he answers. I mean, God could have answered any old way, but he sent Gabriel again. Gabriel had already made one incredible visit to Daniel, but here comes Gabriel. I mean, capital A angel. I mean, this is big time now. The Gabriel comes. And he's got good news for Daniel. God's going to allow Gabriel to give the answers to Daniel. Even more answers than what Daniel was really requesting. The Bible says in verse 21 that God sent Gabriel in a time of extreme weariness. Is that good news for you today? That God's got an answer for you today in your extreme weariness? 
God knows how to speak. He knows how to speak anytime. But if you're weary and you're hungry and you're carrying the weight of sin and you're carrying the weight of regret and you feel aloof and apart from God, God can still speak. He speaks to us in a time of extreme spiritual weariness. God can speak. That's a good God right there. How about this? God delights in giving his understanding to those that he truly treasures. The Bible says in verse 23, get this. The Bible says, verse 23, at the beginning, Gabriel says, at the beginning of your petitions, an answer went out, and I have come to give it, for you are treasured by God. I like this a whole lot. I got chill bumps just saying it. Because here's what's happening. When Daniel... He's decided he's going to get serious about studying God's word. He's in the book of Jeremiah. He's got understanding that the time of desolation is about to com be completed. They're going to be able to go back. He might not make it, but God's people will. They're going to be able to have temple worship again. But he doesn't just simply rejoice. He understands the sin that got him there and the sin of God's people. So he's getting ashes together. He's going to put it on his head. He, he takes off his comfortable clothes and he puts on sackcloth that, that, that's itchy and it's painful. It reminds him of what repentance looks like. And he's fasting. So he's got none of the, the choice food to enjoy. And he's just pouring out his heart. The Bible says that before he began his prayers, the answer was already coming. God had already sent the answer. Gabriel says, I have come to give it. How about this? Why? Because you are treasured by God. If that's all you, you came here for a 30-minute sermon, for me to tell you according to God's holy word that is irrevocable, that you are treasured by God. You're treasured by Him. No matter what. You're treasured by, by Him. And so Gabriel says, look, even before you put the sackcloth on, even before before you put the ashes on your head, the answer was already coming. I've come to deliver it. Why? Because you are treasured by God. That's a good God there. You can get excited about that kind of God. Hey, look, I know we're weary. I'm weary. You're weary. There's a lot of questions, a lot of things, a lot of things in your, your home. A lot of burdens, a lot of regrets, a lot of sin, quite honestly. But we have a good God, and he's sending an answer to us and he's going to encourage us to this answer the answer is already coming all right there's one other point now, as i try to do we'll leave the say the best for last here this is a good point verses 24 through 27 teaches this teaches us this that god will send his son to establish an everlasting righteousness and to judge evil God will send his son to establish an everlasting righteousness and to judge evil. All right, this is big time, verses 24 through 27. Lots of books have been written about this. Verse 24. Seventy weeks are decreed about your people and your holy city to bring the rebellion to an end, to put a stop to sin, to atone for iniquity, to bring an everlasting righteousness, to seal up vision and prophecy, and to anoint the most holy place. No one understand this. From the issuing of the decree to restore and rebuild Jerusalem until an anointed one, the ruler, will be seven weeks and 62 weeks. It will be rebuilt with a plaza and a moat, but in difficult times. After those 62 weeks, the anointed one will be cut off and will have nothing. The people of the coming ruler will destroy the city and the sanctuary. The end will come with a flood. And until the end there will be war, desolations are decreed. He will make a firm covenant with many for one week. But in the middle of the week he will put a stop to sacrifice and offering. And the abomination of desolation will be on a wing of the temple until the decreed destruction is poured out on the desolator. All right. If this was a Wednesday night and we had 10 Wednesday nights, no lie, we could look at all kinds of def different interpretations of these scriptures. But I got good news for you. 
I can see the forest. There is a forest here. There is a basic understanding, and it's one of hope that you and I can rely on. We're going to concentrate on the bigger meaning, the bigger forest, and leave the individual trees for another time. So I'm going to give you some help with this, okay? This will help. Some of these prophecies that Daniel's talking about have already been fulfilled. All the weeks, there's 70 weeks, and then there's 62 weeks, and 70, and all. You know, we can get lost really quickly. I mean, you can have more degrees in the thermometer and theology and still get lost pretty quickly. But I want to tell you this. Some of these things, and we're going to talk about what has already been fulfilled. So you got that. But over here, you've got some things that have not yet been fulfilled. Where are me and you? We're stuck in the middle, okay? We're in the middle. We're in the middle. There's some things after Daniel passes that's going to happen. And we know about those things. But then there's a whole host of other things that have not yet happened. So that'll help you a little bit. And another key is the number seven. I mean, that's a theme here. There's seven, and then there's 70, and all this, and What's that really mean? You might remember Jesus said we should forgive one another 70 times 7. Well, are we supposed to add that up? Hey, Micah, 490, one more, and you're out for the day. I mean, I'm not forgiving you anymore. No, it's, it's a way of saying that we should have a complete heart of forgiveness towards people. So that it's a number of completion. Also, it's a holy number. My favorite number is 4, but if your favorite number is 7, we've got some kids here. That's great because that's kind of a heavenly number. I mean, you, that good things happen with the number seven in the Bible. So what's all this mean? Well, it means that God is in control, theme of Daniel, and he's got an anointed time and it can be trusted. Now, if you start multiplying and dividing and divide, I mean, and, and multiplying again, there's all kinds of different things. But here's what I want you to know. Before the intricate part of this, God says through his prophet or through his angel, um, Gabriel, here's the point, verse 24. To, the point is to bring rebellion to an end, verse 24. Then to put a stop to sin, and then to atone for iniquity, and then to bring an everlasting righteousness. That's the point. All these other things, sure they're important, but there's mysterious, and when's that going to happen? It's already happened. Well, here's the overarching umbrella that God's going to put a stop to sin and iniquity. And he's going to do so because he's going to atone for it. And ultimately, he's going to put the rebellion to an end and set up, are you ready, an everlasting righteousness. That's a whole lot of righteousness, an everlasting righteousness. So in that scripture, it talks about the 62 weeks. What's all that about? 62, verse 26, 62 weeks. It says that the anointed one will be cut off. Here's a clue. It's capital A, capital O, anointed one. That's Jesus. That's Jesus Christ, the Messiah. But it says that he will be cut off. Now, me and you have a clue into that because we know how Jesus suffered. But Daniel's writing these things and he's saying the anointed one is going to be cut off. I don't really like that very much. Ha ha. We know the truth. Jesus Christ, he was born. He was born in Bethlehem. And he lived a perfect life because he is God. No guile was ever found in his mouth. Perfect in every way. Cut off though. Why? It was the will of God. Because he suffered. He suffered on the cross of Calvary. He was cut off from the land of the living, the prophet Isaiah said. Cut off. But through it, God did what he promised he would do through Gabriel. He could atone for sin, our sin. Our sin was paid for by the wonderful sacrifice of Jesus Christ. The anointed one would be cut off. But it's just temporary because he will be victorious forever. Now what about all the exact years, 62 weeks and stuff? If I add up all that, sometimes it makes sense, sometimes it doesn't. Again, on a Wednesday night, we could look at all the things. But the bottom line is, God has established a time. And Jesus himself says, no one knows the date or the time that he will return. 
So don't think you can add it up and multiply it and figure out when Jesus is coming back. Jesus himself said that nobody will know. He's going to come like a thief in the night. Now, this is interesting, though. It says after an anointed one will be cut off. It says the people of the coming ruler will destroy the city and the sanctuary. Well, right now, there's no sanctuary. What Daniel's talking about is God's people go back. Certainly, they will rebuild the city. They will rebuild the temple. But after the anointed one is cut off, that temple will be destroyed. Did that happen, Doug? Yes, it happened. 30 years after Jesus was resurrected from the dead. The Romans said, that's enough. We're tired of dealing with you. We're going to destroy as many Jewish people as we can find. And we will destroy this temple. And they destroyed the temple in 70 A.D. Again, prophesied. This part has already happened. But there's some things that have not yet happened. In verse 27, it talks about this last week. Last week. What's the last week? Well, it's a time that has not yet come. And it talks about this one who is the abomination of desolation. Do you like that name? The abomination of desolation. It's not a wrestler name. No, it's the Antichrist. And the Antichrist will come. I get asked this question, is the Antichrist alive? I, I don't know. I have no idea. But I know this, according to the scripture, that the Antichrist will come. And that he is going to put a stop to sacrifice and offering. And then it says that on the wing of the temple, there's going to be this destruction that ultimately be poured out on him, the end of verse 27. God will put an end of the days of rain to the Antichrist. So you say, wow, that's some amazing scripture. Look at it this way. There's some certain things that have already happened. There's some things that have not yet happened. I don't know if it's this week. I don't know if it's next week. It could be 100 years from now. We don't know when the Lord is going to say that is enough and sends Jesus to come rescue us and put an end to evil. But what are we to do in the meantime? Focus in on him. We are to focus in on him. You know, they were not ready for the first visitation of Jesus, right? As the scripture says, there was no room for him in the inn, right? And he spent his 35 years roughly of his life and he was um, ridiculed. Not many people believed him, ultimately hung on a cross for our sin. We did not understand the day of his first visitation. And I'm afraid that most of us will not be ready for his second coming as well. But you and I can. We can humble ourselves and we can say, I believe in you. In a crazy world that's probably going to get crazier, I'm going to focus in on the truth of your word. I'm going to be like Daniel. And I'm not going to worry about this king or this king. I'm going to keep my eyes straight on you. That was Daniel's testimony. And because of his faithfulness, God told Daniel what was going to happen. And so we must be prepared ourselves in a room this big. I know that there are many of us that have not yet made that life-changing decision to follow him. Maybe some of you at home. But you can today. And you don't have to wear sackcloth. You don't have to put ashes on your head. You can just confess. The Bible says that all who confess him and say the name of Jesus and ask Christ to be transformed by him shall be saved. We repent of our sin. We repent of our way. And we say, Jesus, I need you. And I want to live my life for you. And we confess that. We turn from our ways and we embrace his ways. And we are changed and we're transformed. And you can do that today. You can do that at home. Just tell him, say, Lord, I need you. And if you make that decision, absolutely, let me know. Now, others of us here in this room, maybe because you've gotten your eyes focused on COVID-19 or all the distractions, family, school, whatever, now is the time, like Daniel, to come back to him. To repent of your own way and say, God, I believe you love me. I understand that I'm treasured by you. And I want to live my life for your glory. I'm tired of doing it my way. Hear me today. You can do it. You can say, Jesus, I kind of like the prodigal son. I want to come home. I know that you are my life. 
And I want to treasure you as you've treasured me. That could be your decision today. In just a moment, we're going to sing. We're going to stand up. Our musicians are going to come right after I pray. We're going to play a song of invitation. We're going to sing. Others of you that are ready to make a decision, Micah and Gretchen are going to be in the back. We have a room, that kind of a room, that counseling room. They can pray with you, whatever your decision is. I encourage you to go in the back and let Micah and Gretchen and others pray with you about your decision. Pray with me now, please. Lord, this is your word, and you promised to bless it. And we thank you that we have the privilege to trust in you today. And I know there are others of us here that are ready to embrace you, maybe for the first time, to repent of sin and say, I need you to be my Savior. Others of us, we just need to embrace you because we've turned and went our own way. But we've seen your word and we've seen how you love us in response to a crazy world. We come to a certain God. And I pray for those that are going to make that decision today. Father, we love you. Jesus, this is all for you. It's in your name we pray, Jesus. Amen. Will you stand with me, please? Let's respond. Let's sing as we're led. time of desperation when all we know is doubt and fear there is only one foundation we believe we believe This broken generation, when all is dark, you help us see. There is only one salvation. We believe. We believe. We believe in Jesus Christ. We believe in the Holy Spirit. And He's given us new life. We believe in the crucifixion. We believe that He conquered death. We believe in the resurrection. And He's coming back again. faith be more than thoughts, greater than the songs we sing, and in our weakness and temptation, we believe. We believe that He conquered death. We believe in the resurrection. And He's coming back again. Let the lost be found and the dead be raised in the here and now. Let love invade, let the church live out. Our God will say we believe. We believe in the gates of hell. Will not prevail for the power of God is toward the veil. Now we know your love will never fail. We believe, we believe, we believe in God the Father. We believe in Jesus Christ. We believe in the Holy Spirit. And he's 
Would you be seated for just a moment? We just sang, and he's coming back again. That's our focus. And be prepared. Well, today we have come to a very important end of our service. And really, it's a beginning. It's an end, but it's a beginning because God has got great plans for Josh and Hannah Morton. And we're going to be able to share with them a little bit of our love, but we're going to do it through social distancing. So right out here to my left, we've got some tables set up, and it's in shade, and we've got a tent. And if you will just social distance five or six feet apart from families and groups, you can go by there and just be able to share a word of appreciation. We're going to do that. But let me say as pastor that I'm so grateful for these two, and I'm going to pray for them, and I think Josh is going to share a word from his heart. And so when I pray to dismiss this and pray for Josh and Hannah, don't be offended. They're going to sneak out, okay, and they're going to go uh, to the tent. But uh, God has used these people in a beautiful way. I'm so glad that we've had a great, great service. Josh's parents are with us. They are great, great people. And so the Lord's got plans for them. The Lord's got plans for us. But Josh, you just share from your heart for a moment. Well, I just want to take a, a moment to be able to say thank you so much for embracing Hannah and I and loving us. Um, this has been an incredible time, uh, as I shared in the first service. Uh, before I came and was uh, the worship minister here, um, a lot of my friends said, you know, that, that are worship ministers as well, said, you know, you're get ready for, for emails, get ready for phone calls, and and get ready for complaints and things like that because it's, it's worship ministry and that's what sometimes happens. And um, I stand by to this day that to this day no one has ever complained to me about a single thing with our worship services here at Greer First Baptist. And I don't think that's a testament to me. Um, I don't think that's a testament to our staff. I think that's a testament to who the people of Greer First Baptist are. So thank you so much for loving us well and thank you for supporting us as we go into this new phase of life powerfully said and uh, as I know you love them and as I pray for them uh, just continue to pray they got a lot to do I mean they're going to be near DC they got a lot, a lot of straightening out to do in Washington DC area amen so pray for them days ahead the leadership team got together and from from our heart we wanted to present Josh and Hannah a gift from our church so there you go. We love you and excited for what God is. Can we give the Lord a hand and give them a hand? Amen. You know, the Lord, the Lord is at work. The Lord is at work. Let's stand together and let's pray. And Josh and Hannah are going to sneak out. Lord, you are good. And you have blessed us for three and a half years with Josh and Hannah Morton. And we, we celebrate that you've got a new ministry for them. And Lord, with a complete assurance, we know you have a new future for us in worship ministry. But more importantly than all of that, we must keep our eyes focused on you, Jesus. Allow us to do that in a way that pleases you the most. We love you, Christ. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Those of you in the back, you can be dismissed. Those in the middle and front, wait just a moment, and we will be dismissed. God bless you.